Welcome to the future. First and foremost, we are on a live radio show. Doesn't matter. You're going to make up your own facts. Anyway, getting attacked by a lion, sticking your head in a blender. Just slow your pumpkin spice roll. Although this brace makes me look way cooler than I am. Is not really a sentence I ever thought I would utter. I could get high. That would certainly elevate something. Like, I would be an awesome Tyrannosaurus Rex right now. None of those. None of these. That's been the problem all along. And their plan was basically world domination. Because it's actually bananas. Like, literally and figuratively. Walmart was famous for moving into a town, selling pickles for a dollar, and putting every other store in town out of business. Because what are you going to do about it? I'm a huge fan of a drink ticket. It can swing from my nuts for all I care. Hard Rock Lunch Box. Ah, greetings and salutations, everyone. Welcome, members of the Hard Rock Lunch Box and viewers, of course, of the Top 20. And for those of you on TikTok not smart enough to realize what's going on, we are doing a live radio show that happens to get recorded for a podcast replay on Spotify and Apple Music. And we are recording the Top 20 first 20 so minutes of the show so that we can put out the video of the top 20 but first and foremost we are on a live radio show you can check it out right now if you wanted to although not if you're watching it because we're in the future uh it is a live radio show on 99 wnrr.com you can check it out every thursday from noon to two if you don't believe me and even if you don't believe me it doesn't matter you're going to make up your own facts anyway welcome to the future it is a incredibly and shockingly warm August 1st, uh, 2024. We've made it, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we have made it to August. And uh, I, don't, I don't care for it, to be perfectly honest with you. It's a little too warm for me. And uh, as much as I do tend to prefer uh, nice weather over bad weather, I always prefer cold weather to uh, warm weather. And I know that there's definitely two different camps uh, of that. A lot of the peeps I tend to associate with really do like the cold weather for the main reason that they can wear a hoodie. You wear a hoodie today, you're going to die. Like, that's basically what it comes down to. And, you know, that seems like a really lame way to go. Like, when there's options out there, like getting attacked by a lion, sticking your head in a blender, driving off a bridge, that kind of stuff. So, all I can tell you is this is the eighth month of the year. We have basically two more months until we get to October. Now, I know all you white women are about to get really excited over that statement. Just slow your pumpkin spice roll. We'll get there when we get there. I believe it was last turn off Broadway that said that, so it's probably not true. Um, so, yeah. Um, doing my best to hold things together. Uh, oh, thank you for asking. Uh, so... <laughs> I am not in the new episode or series of Mad Max, although this brace makes me look way cooler than I am or the injury that it's supporting. Uh, it is a shoulder cuff brace uh, because your host has got a slight tear in his rotator cuff. Now, you could ask yourself, what were you doing? Were you like building pyramids or lifting up cars to save babies? And I would say all of that. But I'd also be lying directly to you. Do you remember a couple weeks ago when I said I was like kind of hurting my shoulder a little bit? So I was like doing push-ups and flies? Well, instead of listening to the warnings that my body was so clearly sending up flares about, I was like, I'll just push through it. We'll just tape it up. Which you can't do once you reach the end of life like I have because things start breaking. So that's what I did. I did too many push-ups, which is not really a sentence I ever thought I would utter in my mediocre life, but I did. I did too many push-ups and then decided to follow that up with rounds of flies. Now, I do like flies. I always did. And now I have a tear in my rotator cuff, which if you've never had one, um, how do I describe this? Um, lift your arm up like that. Like, take your arm out. Well, if you're in radio, you can't see, but if you take, put your arm out to your side, take your, well, take any arm, stick it out to your side. Now slowly lift it up until you get about, I don't know, 45 degree angle. Now put some lightning in your shoulder, and that's what it feels like to have a rotator cuff. So uh, that's what it is. I am on the RICE protocol, which is rest, ice, compression, and 
equate rest, ice, compression, and elevation. I can't really elevate my shoulder more than I can because I'm already 6'1". This is about it. Uh, I think if I were like Annie Stoic or whatever, maybe I'd stand on a milk crate or something. I don't really know how to elevate where I'm at. Uh, I could get high. That would certainly elevate something, uh, but probably not my shoulder. And uh, anyway, so thank you for asking. I'm wearing this brace. It's actually not, it's doing more today because I decided to wear it over my shirt. All the pictures of how to put this on are usually like dudes in much better shape than me with their shirts off putting it on. Uh, and I think that's how you're supposed to wear it. But I think I, I'm i still adjusting to the new size that I am. So I think I ordered too big of a size. I did do the chest measurement like it said to. And I ordered the right one. But I guess people lie about their chest size. Much like, you know, guys lie about other things. And so it just, it felt like a little big. So, But I'm wearing it over my shirt. And I actually get a little bit more compression. But the main reason I'm wearing it is because it just serves as a reminder. Like, hey, Stu not. Don't use your left arm for anything if you can avoid it. Or just do stuff like... Like, I would be an awesome Tyrannosaurus Rex right now. Or at least on the left side, I could do all that. But I'm not. So I'm just a radio show host currently. So anyway, uh, if you're wondering, that's what that's about. Uh, I'm hoping to heal in the next couple weeks. I'm not doing any exercises where my, my, where my arm leaves my shoulder at all. So none of those. None of these. You know, none of this. And... Uh, Hopefully in two weeks I can kind of get back. And um, if you guys could all do me like a slight personal favor, the next time I talk about a body part that's hurting, can somebody just in the chat be like, yo, stupid, can you just take a little bit easier on that and not do that or whatever it is I'm supposed to be doing or whatever? Uh, and that way maybe I won't hurt myself and derail absolutely everything I'm doing. So thank you for that in advance I appreciate that let's get to some light housekeeping please uh, we've got a brand new top 20 out um, on uh, YouTube uh, on Strangerhood TV where you can find not only Bacon is My Podcast and all things Craving Strange but you can find this stupid show too uh, if you're watching it you probably already know that feel free to comment on there I'm hoping this weekend I'll be able to catch up on comments but I feel like I say that a lot I'll catch up on them I'll catch up on them eventually please leave them I really enjoy having that engagement I truly do. Uh, it's about audio illusions, and I talk about me being at the bottom of the overpass uh, because I was doing leg day at the gym and then walking 20, 25 minutes home and then realizing there's a huge hill in the way, uh, which is very hard after you do. Like, I don't know, this inside, when you do the in, when you do the hip adductors, the adduction, not abduction, but the adduction where you're squeezing, squeezing like that. So you have this tiny little muscle on the inside of your thigh, right? And I... Am, I am very strong. I am very strong in that capacity where I can do like well over 200 pounds. But like I just don't use that muscle all that often. Like I don't even know what you use it for other than doing exactly these. But like I am trying to actually crowd out some fat. And I know you can't you can't target a body area to remove fat. Like that's not that's a myth that doesn't actually work. By the way, I've got a good story about a myth for you. Um, but about workout myths, um, you know, I probably won't get to. So. Why even set it up? Um, but uh, I do have a lot of fat in that area. I carry all my fat right on the inside of my thighs. Not that you notice. Thank you for not asking. And my probably solid A cups at this point. And, of course, my belly because that's where stress lives. And I I don't know if you know this about me. I have a fair amount of stress. And, yes, thank you. It's replenished every single day. I get a morning delivery of it. So it's like the old school like milk bottles, but it's stress. Uh, but you can crowd fat out by adding muscle, and it just kind of pushes fat a little to the side or pushes it up. But it's like, you know, the whole body composition, like if you add more and more rocks to water, like there'll still be water in there, but you'll have a lot of rocks in there too. So that's my plan. That's why I'm targeting those muscles. But they're very small muscles, uh, especially for your legs. They're not like your thigh or your hamstrings. Like those are, and your glute. Like those are some of the biggest muscles in your body. Except my traps tend to be the biggest muscles in my body because they're usually inflamed and angry and on fire. But that's why I was working on them. It becomes very difficult to walk over a bridge. That's all I was trying to say. Please plan accordingly. Um, 
Yeah, Broken Windows Policy, 100 Beats from In an Alley. It's a good episode, I think. Check it out. I like the very beginning of it. I always find that part funny, but you know that. Another show notes, uh, Rebel 9 has a show, our last show of the year, scheduled. I'm sure we'll add something else, but it will be at Nostalgia tomorrow night. We take the stage around 10. We've never played Nostalgia as a full band. My band is definitely stressing it just for the amount of room we won't have on stage, uh, but... You know, we'll see. It's going to be a fun show. It's going to be a fun set. Uh, the band had uh, all the input on the set. So, um, and it's sounding really good. Actually, the last time we ran ran the set was probably the best we've ever played those songs. I just hope that carries on until tomorrow night. We're going to rehearse again today, tonight, and, uh, before we load up, and uh, we'll just, you know, go from there. But you don't need to know any of that. Um... The discussions and drinks for the week on Bacon is My Podcast is the truth about ego and is it always bad. I happen to be a big fan of uh, studying ego and a big student of it because I do find it interesting because it is completely one thing to have an ego that is not deserved. It is completely another one to have a healthy ego that is deserved. So I'm curious to see what the boys have to say on that. So I'll be listening to that at some point this week if I get an opportunity to go for a walk. The rest of my week looks bananas, so I'm just not sure that I'm going to get to anything but whatever so that's uh that's that i think i'm gonna not do the myth about working out until next week mainly because the video i was watching from kurt kurt Gazat, i can't even pronounce it it's super interesting but there's going to be a part two of it so maybe i'll just wait and i'll just talk about them both at the same time uh so that'll be uh something to look forward to uh which is going to be unusual for this show so i do have a bunch of new music for you by the way <clears throat> but I really wasn't feeling up to it. Uh, I just, I really wasn't feeling like talking so much about uh, me and stuff that uh, is going on. So I was actually going to just end the top 20 early. But I did happen to catch a report on um, most something nation something. I forget the name of the channel. But it's something that talks about like, it's kind of like um, nerd politics a little bit. Oh, I can't remember the name of it. But like they go into kind of like a like a quick journal journalism show and they go into things like you wouldn't necessarily be discussing most favorite nation no that's not i can't remember i can't remember what it is and uh i'm sorry i'll probably link to uh the clip in here um uh when i post the video but i wanted to read you something because i thought it was interesting and uh, like i said i was very interested in this like 10 minute clip about uh the person i'm going to discuss um so this goes back to 2017, um, and a law student, uh, her name is Lena Khan, wrote this article that posted, honestly, I don't even remember where it posted, some journal, I should have brought it, but I didn't, 2017, and the, the, the introduction from the New York Times about this particular article I thought was, was interesting. So the article itself is called uh, Amazon's, um, Amazon's Mon Monopoly Paradox. Again, this is 2017. That's pre-COVID, so that's in, that's interesting because, or that's important because it'll become interesting in a little bit. But the New York Times kind of intro on this article or post, it's it's a law, it's like a 22-page letter, right, uh, from some sort of like law journal or whatever on on economics, economics. But the introduction is this quote. Even as Amazon became one of the largest retailers in the country, it never seemed interested in charging enough to make a profit. Customers celebrated and the competition languished. That's been the problem all along. That is also not entirely true anymore about the profit. And that's a whole other story. But at 2017, pre-COVID, Amazon had a plan. And their plan was basically world domination, which is trust and monopolistic, monopolistic practices, which is something I keep talking about. Like if anybody follows my Instagram, they probably saw my post yesterday about the letter that I wrote to Amazon t correcting their usage of next of same day because they keep guaranteeing me same day service. Guaranteeing. It says it in the order and the note that comes with it. They guarantee same day service. And then most of the time, I don't get it till the next day. Well, that's called next day delivery. So I don't, or next day service. So I don't, so I wrote them a letter. I just, I guess maybe nobody brought it to their attention. Like, so, so that was that. And I posted that on Instagram and maybe that. Anyway, so I've been talking about Amazon off and on for years, but this is super interesting. And the person that wrote it is super interesting. And if I still have time, I'll talk about that. So again, her name is Lena Khan. If that name sounds familiar. Good for you. Give yourself a good gold star because she should. Uh, and 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 I'll I'll get into that. But anyway, here's here's the abstract on this 22-page paper. 
Amazon is the titan of 21st century uh, commerce. In addition to being a retailer, it is now a marketing platform, a delivery and logistics network, a payment service, a credit lender, an auction house, a major book publisher, a producer of television and films, a fashion designer, a hardware manufacturer, and a leading host of cloud server space. Although Amazon has clocked staggering growth, it generates meager profits, choosing to price below cost and expand widely instead. This is not an uncommon thing. Lots of pump, lots of companies do this um, uh, widely instead. Through this strategy, the company has positioned itself at the center of e-commerce and now serves as essential infrastructure. Remember what I said about pre-COVID. Now remember how essential Amazon was during COVID. So it now serves as an essential infrastructure for a host of other businesses that depend upon it. Elements of the firm's structure and conduct pose anti competitive concerns, yet it, is, it has escaped antitrust scrutiny. This note argues that the current framework in antitrust, specifically its pegging, competi- <laughs> pegging. <laughs> its pegging competition to, quote, consumer welfare, defined as, short-term pr- defined as short-term price effects, is unequipped to capture the architecture of market power in the modern, uh, modern economy. We cannot cognize... Hey, I like that's a good word. I never even heard that. We cannot cognize the p- potential harms to competition posed by Amazon's dominance if we measure competition primarily through price and output. Specifically, current doctrine underappreciates the risk of predatory pricing and how inter- integration across distinct business lines may prove anti-competitive. These concerns are heightened in the context of online platforms for two reasons. First, the economics of platform markets create incentives for a company to pursue growth over profits. Told you, that's not unusual. Um, A strategy that investors have rewarded. Under these conditions, predatory pricing becomes highly rational, even as existing doctrine treats it as irrational and therefore implausible. Second, because online platforms serve as critical intermediaries, integrating across business lines and positions these platforms to control the essential infrastructure on which their rivals depend. The dual role also enables a platform to exploit information collected on companies using its services to undermine them as competitors, right? That's the data mining. If you keep ordering from their competitors through their platform, they have access to that, and then they can create their own knockoff versions. Anybody ever buy anything from Amazon Basic? That's what that is. This note maps out facets of Amazon's dominance. Doing so enables us to make sense of its business strategy, illuminates anti-competitive aspects of Amazon's structure and conduct, and underscores deficiencies in in current doctrine. The note closes by considering two potential regimes for addressing Amazon's power, restoring traditional antitrust and competition policy principles, or applying common carrier obligations and duties. That's just the abstract, right? So that's basically what this entire note is about. I would highly encourage anybody to read it. I think it's Amazon's antitrust. It's Amazon's antitrust paradox. You can search that up if you want and take a look at it. It is incredibly well cited because it has been such a problem over the past years. As I said, think about all this being written in 2017 and then remember how essential Amazon became in 2020. And now also consider how many businesses now don't even bother doing their own shipping and logistics. They always say, go visit our Amazon store. Store. I was trying to buy stuff from Eargasm not too long ago directly because I do try and support these companies directly. And their pricing on their store was like 50 bucks while it was 35 on Amazon. And I messaged them. I was like, hey man, I'd much rather buy this from you, but you're not even competing with your own competition. And they were like, yeah, just buy it from Amazon. Like that is complete like acquiescence, like at the, at, at the, at its best, like you're not even trying anymore. Like that to me is just bananas. Now, as I said a couple of weeks ago, like it's good to see that Amazon is starting to lose a little market share as companies like Target and Walmart really go after that market. But you know, Amazon just dominates it. And yes, those meager profits that they're talking about are meager profits on stuff at the time because they undersell you. You know, like lost leaders are. That's the stuff at the at the register that they just get you to buy. Or sometimes it's the sale item. Like, hey man, come in and buy this lease car. Oh, I'm sorry we don't have those anymore. How about this Mercedes instead? Like, they're all practices and they're all strategies, strategies in economics. And the problem is our doctrines of these antitrust laws are still from the 1890s. When, thank 
God, our government realized that there might be a problem consolidating the power of all the radi- all the railroads, all of the sugar, all of the oil into the hands of just people like the Rockefellers, the Vanderbilts, and all those dudes. I mean, if you ever want to see like how monopolies work in the in the current area, do do a study on what we did in Central America with bananas. It'll blow your mind because it's actually bananas, like literally and figuratively. So, this is an important article. It's been cited a million times, and it's a really good predictor of what exactly happened. And here in 2024, we can look back and see exactly how it happened. Something like 65% of people's first search for a product they want to buy is on Amazon. Now, yeah, you might not think that's a monopoly because, yes, there's other places to get it. But when you have such dominance over everything, you can undercut the competition. And it's funny that Walmart is the competition that's being undercut here because Walmart was famous for moving into a town, selling pickles for a dollar, and putting every other store in town out of business. That is the that is the Walmart strategy. And they kept fighting, we're not a monopoly. We're not, you know, anti We're not trust. We're not a, none of those things. But yeah, you're anti-competitive, and because you're so big, you can do that. You can take a loss at a store for five years if you know for the next 25 you've got the town in your pocket, if you have deep enough pockets to do that. And that was the point of this whole article. Now, the reason I bring this up is because the woman, the young woman that wrote, very young woman actually that wrote it while she was still in law, law school, her name is Lena Khan. And as I said, if that name sounds familiar, give yourself a good gold star because who she is now is the head of the FTC. She's the head of the FTC in the Biden administration and one of the very few administration officials that works very bipartisanship. In fact, in the, in the thing I was watching uh, last night, she was actually getting some praise from people like J.D. Vance, that douchebag, and Matt Gates, that other douchebag, along with like Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, because what she's doing is something that really hasn't been done since Effectively, the 1890s, and they even compare it to the uh, the FTC head under Obama, who took a very like, let's leave, you know, we'll leave this stuff alone because we don't want to punish businesses that are doing well. Whereas Lena Khan is like, we want to punish businesses that are punishing other businesses because that is the spirit of these laws, and in the e-commerce world. They don't have the laws for this. I mean, they have stuff like you can't own every railroad in, you know, in, 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 in the entire region. Like, well, that's not really a problem and also it didn't really work out too well. But people don't privately own the railroads so much anymore anyway because there's such mass in- infrastructure. Anybody that's ever been on Amtrak or the MTA knows they're pretty much government funded at this point, which is honestly the way it should be. It'd be actually really good if we had like all of our mass transportation owned by the government. Like, you ever notice, like, other countries have, like, their own airline, like Alitalia or Lufthansa or, you know, that you know, United, um, what's, uh, British Airways and stuff like that? Like, these are government, like, maintained airlines and, and mass infrastructure. So, like, transportation infrastructure. And that's probably a good way to do it because they serve the public, public interest without having, like, corporate greed just rip everybody off. And I've bitched about the airlines enough. And anybody that's actually tried to fly the airlines recently knows exactly what I'm talking about because there's no punishment for them. They just leave you stranded because what are you going to do about it? Like, you're stranded somewhere. Like, oh, yeah, here's your Uber certificate. I mean, Corey was telling me last time he was stuck flying from uh, Dallas to Austin. It was like six hours late, and they gave him a drink ticket. Now, I'm a huge fan of a drink ticket, and I support that move, but I think if you're going to waste somebody's time for six hours doing a service that you made them pay for in advance, non-refundable, by the way, I think maybe maybe two drink tickets would be in for but anyway, that's Lena Khan. You should check her out. The reason I'm a fan of hers and know who she is is because she is the one that put forth the new guidelines on anti and non-compete clauses, basically rendering non-complete cla- non-compete clauses in your employment contracts unenforceable, which to me is awesome because every single time I've had to take on more employment, there is always a non-compete clause in there. In fact, the last time my company that I worked for got bought out, I had to sign a brand new non-compete and that was good for 12 months. That means I can't work in my my field 
for 12 months if I get fired. Not in, and like I had switched it last time I had that. I was like, you can enforce that if I quit, but if I get fired, I'm immediately going to your competition. Now, fortunately, in New York State, it is almost impossible to enforce those things. So that's fine. But now, as a national level thing, it's great. They say it's going to actually add the potential to, from like 50 to 100 billion dollars in salaries. Because imagine working at your job and a competitor comes by and like, hey, we'll give you an extra 10% a year, plus we'll cover your benefits and you can have more vacation time. But you can't take that job because you have a 12-month non-compete clause in your current contract. Is that cool? Nope. And your company that you work for now knows that. So they don't have to give you your raise. But if they can't enforce it and you're like, hey, company XYZ just offered me that. Can you offer me that? They might have to seriously consider it. And that's a good thing for workers. I've always thought that's a good thing for workers, which is why I never intend to uh, comply with my non-complete. Like, they can swing from my nuts for all I care and take me to court. Good luck getting me there on a weekday, my friend. (laughs) That's what I'm saying. So I've talked enough. I've talked way more than I thought I was going to talk. But I do think that was kind of important. I'm sorry if it bored the entire audience. I will now check on the chat, and I will wake them up as much as possible. Uh, I think it's important to know your enemies in this world. And that segue has been brought to you by Know Your Enemy and the Hard Rock Lunchbox. (laughs) 